Hey everybody, welcome to our next Java Basics tutorial video. Today I'm going to be going over math methods, scanners, and errors within Java. And I will make a project file as well as some extra problems and get that out to you hopefully by tomorrow. I'll let you guys know if that does change. But as for now, this is just going to be a standalone video. You guys take your time to learn these concepts because this is a definitely, I'd say, a bit harder and then the rest of them, it's going to be a lot of content to cover. So just uh, bear with me and definitely ask questions once this video is over. All right, so let's get started. <clears throat> so, so far, what you guys have been doing is creating variables, um, doing operations on them, and then printing something out to the console. But what if, say, you want the user, which could be someone else if you hand your computer to someone else, to actually interact with the code and not have to edit it directly? So that's where something called scanner comes in. What scanner allows you to do is, well, one of the main things it's used for is to read user input from either a file or from something called the console, which I'll show you guys in a little bit. And the other thing it's used for is just essentially, well, as the name says, scanning through strings or basically most file types, you can look through that, but that's a little bit of advanced application of scanner. So as for now, we're just gonna use it as we can read input from this and we can also look through some strings on a basic level. So that's how we get input. And here's another thing that this is one of the reasons that this is going to be a little bit of a harder video. We're going to go into the advanced version of primitive creation, which is essentially something called object creation. And if you guys have seen the software channel, um, object oriented programming is what Mustafa is teaching. And that is the next step up for Java. It's definitely more complicated. However, object oriented programming, because it's so integral to Java, you guys will be using it even on these lower levels when you have to just maybe not necessarily make your own objects, but you have to use them. So scanner is the perfect example of an object that we don't make because it's built into Java, but we use it. And in using it, we have to know a little bit about how objects are created. So I'm going to give a very, very, very simplistic definition of basically what an object is. As of right now, an object in Java for you guys and your level of understanding is a piece of data that has state and behavior that can do things for you that are predefined within the object itself. Now, what does that mean? There are plenty of different object types. One of them being scanner, um, another one being math, which we'll go over later. But essentially what, what it is is this. It is the advanced version of a primitive. A primitive was the most basic thing that you can instantiate within Java. And it was quite simple to instantiate, right? Just like the name of the primitive and then the your name that you give the primitive and then like what you assign its value. But now what we're going to do with objects is since objects are a bit more complicated, what you can do is it's the same thing. You give the object name, so like the physical name of the object that we can refer to it as. In this case, we'll be creating an object of scanner. So we're going to type in scanner. And this is just like, say I was making a string or an integer. I type in the name of what I want to make. So that's what I want to make, right? I want to make a scanner. So then I give it a name. Now the traditional name for scanners is SC. So I'm going to call mine SC or I have one down there. So I'm going to call it SC1 or something like that. Scanner SC1. And now I want to set it equal to something now that I have a scanner SC1. But instead of just giving like a value for scanner, we have to create an object of type scanner. We have to create some storage within or some data within the storage of the computer that will act as an object. So you can give bits of data to that part or address in the memory and it'll spit something out for us because that's what objects do. They're basically like mini processors or well, at this level, they are mini processors and especially scanner is the best example of that. So instead of just giving it like a value like F, like we would to a string, what we're going to do is type in the keyword new. Okay. You'll see it cause it'll turn purple. And then we'll type in the name of the object once again. And then just like how, when we were working with string methods, you passed in parameters through parentheses. What you do here is you give it parentheses and then you give the object basically a starting condition and objects, as you can see, all of these are essentially starting conditions for the object. Like I can give it a file to read this scanner can be reading a file. I can give it a string if, it, if I want to read um, a string for this scanner, or I can even type in something called system dot in. I can put a semicolon and I have created a scanner object. 
So now let's break this down again because there's probably a lot to take in. So first things first, you type out the name of the object you want to make. In this case, it's scanner. You give the object a name, which in this case, I called it SC1. And then you type in the keyword new, and then you type in the name of the object again, and then you open and close parentheses, and you pass in input parameters, or this is essentially called a constructor. You're constructing the object, and constructors have parameters that you pass into them. So you call the constructor, which is basically this part right here. You're calling a constructor. You're making an object, and you're telling it, here are the materials by which you are going to be making your object. And in this case, the materials you're giving it is system.in. And what this means for the scanner is that, hey, I can read the system in. And what is the system in exactly? That is the console input. So what this scanner object can do for us is read in input from the console. So let's actually apply that. But first, why don't we go over some scanner methods? These are just like string methods in the sense that you will type in the name that you gave your scanner, type dot, and then you can see all of them pop up here. Now, obviously, I don't have all of them in this list because then it would take up like what more than a page of this code, but you can look them up online if you want to find really specific things. There are some things that are outside the scope of this video, so I tried to get the ones that are most relevant and most useful. So let's start off with has next. So essentially what has next does is that it will get if given a string because scanner input is always starts off as a string because right you want to read it just in a list of characters it returns true if there is something to read in so that is what has next does has next int tells you if the next thing you're going to read in is an integer and then you can guess what has next double does it tells you whether or not the next thing that you're going to read and it could be thing it could be about just about anything it tells you whether the next thing you are going to be able to read in is a double and then of course has next boolean tells you if the next thing that you're going to read in is a boolean so um just like i talked about before with like return types i think i brushed over them vaguely essentially what this means is that if i was to call sc1 dot has next no not scq sorry sc1 how I would use this chunk of code is I would treat it like a Boolean. Like, because what will happen is once I run the code and I actually, the Java compiles this and runs it for me, it'll call the method has next. And what this whole chunk of code will essentially be replaced with once the code runs is either a true or a false. So you treat it like a Boolean. And this goes for any return type. If a method has a return type string, you will put it in the code pretending it's a string because ultimately when the code runs, it will be replaced by a string of some value. Obviously that is dependent on what exactly the method is. So in this case, what you would use these methods in is if checks, you'd write an if check and then you do if sc dot has next, then do something to that next token. Now we, if say we get a value of true from that has next, and now we're executing what's inside the if check. Well, now, how do we get the data? So that's this next of a four set of methods here. Next basically reads in the next token, and I'll tell you what that is in a little bit. Next token as a string. Next int reads it in as an integer. Next double reads it in as a double, and the next boolean reads it in as a boolean. You get the idea. Now what you can do with this is because these each have return types of string int double and boolean you can treat these as those return types so if i call sc1.next like for example i will create a string right now string s and i will set it equal to the value of sc1.next because what this is doing is essentially saying okay when i when i run my code i'm going to get the next token that the scanner sc1 provides to me and because that token since i called next is returned as a type string i can set that equal to a string so that's how return types work i didn't really explain that well in the last video with string methods so i really wanted to get into it here when you know that something returns a certain type you can set it equal to a variable of that type and you can treat it as if it was that type and as if you had like just typed in a string plain old string except obviously what sc1.next returns 
like the actual value of the string will be variable. But what is constant is the fact that it is a string. All right, and then the next line method essentially doesn't care about tokens. And I said, I'll get into what exactly a token is in a little bit. It essentially just reads the entire line for you. Whatever has been typed into the console, as soon as you click enter, it will read from the beginning of when you started typing to the end of when you started typing. All right. And that's what next line is used for. If you want to just read in everything that the user typed in and not just the first thing that they typed in. And now finally, I can actually talk about what tokens are with use delimiter. So when you create a scanner object, by default, it will have something called a delimiter. And what that does, it tells Java once it actually starts doing these methods on like the string or whatever is being read into scanner, what do you consider a separate token? So when you write words out, you essentially distinguish words through spaces. Like if I was to write an essay without using any spaces, one word would flow into the next and you wouldn't be able to know which word is what. But by using spaces, I can take a word and say, yes, this is a standalone word. And I can check, okay, there's a space in between this word and the next. So therefore this is the next word. And obviously our brains do that extremely fast. You're doing it right now by reading the text, but computers can actually do it better than us because what they can do is not just look for spaces like our minds are programmed to. They can look for anything to differentiate tokens. And now just what I said, replace the word word with token. Essentially each, if you, if you don't uh, change the delimiter because the default delimiter is a white space, which is just a space bar. You press the space bar. If you were not to change the delimiter um, of a scanner, what it would do is if you called the next function, it would read in essentially the next word until the space. So say I typed in something along the lines of the scanner was reading in hello, how are you? And then I called sc.next and then told it to print out whatever I got from sc.next. It would print out the word hello. And then say I call it again, it would print out the word how. And then I call it again, it would print out the word r, and it would print out the word u if I called it a fourth time. Now how this works is that the default delimiter for a scanner is a space, and there are spaces separating these words, therefore each word can be read in as a token. Now, Let's say I want to read in hello, how are you as a full string? That's when I would use next line. And then let's say I had hello, how are you? But then I had a colon in between each one. Now, if I was to call ha sorry, not has next. If I was to call next on this string and I was reading this string into scanner, then it would just print out hello, how are you? And not hello. Like say I want to separate it into the words. So what I would do is I would call the use delimiter method and pass in a parameter. Remember passing in means you put whatever you want to pass in inside the parentheses when you call the method. I would pass in a string that simply held the value of colon. Mm -hmm. And what this will do is tell Java, okay, instead of looking for spaces to separate tokens, you want to look for colons. So every time you see a colon, anything before that will be considered a word and anything after it up till the next colon will be considered a word. Now, one small, I guess, like nuance about this is that if you do change the delimiter, you have to add an ending one onto your string. So if you didn't use the delimiter and you just kept it like blank and these are all like spaces, pretend the colons are spaces, it would read in hello, how are you? But once you change the delimiter to colon, you have to add a delimiter to the very end or whatever you call your delimiter to the very end so that it can detect things in between them. So essentially it'll read in the first word and then anything in between two delimiters will be considered a token. So if you don't put a delimiter at the end, it'll look, okay, here's my colon. Now let's look for the next colon. Oh, there's no next colon. So I'm going to wait for that. And it'll never come because you can't edit the string once you actually pass it into scanner. So it'll just essentially stop the program there because it's looking for a colon that'll never exist. That's why you want to add one at the very end. So now let's uh, use these methods because I mean, I've been talking about them in theory, but using them makes it a lot uh, simpler. So we'll go back to system.in in a little bit and how we can actually read an input from the console. But for now, what I'm going to be using in scanner is just this functionality as a string scanner. So as you can see here, I've made an object of type scanner, called it SC, and then passed in the string A space B space C. 
So now what I can do is if I was to run this program and you can see what I'm printing out here, I call the next method and then I add on O O O and then I call the next again, same method here and here. I print out O O O and then I also concatenate on the next, the next, next, <laughs> and then finally concatenate on O O O. So knowing how next works and knowing that we haven't changed the delimiter. So the default delimiter is white space. Therefore tokens are denoted by a white space in between them. Please take a moment to just think about what will this output actually be to the console. And then I'll run the program and then you can check if you're correct. Okay. Hopefully you at least thought of something. And then let's run this program and you will see it'll print out a o o o b o o o c o o o so what does this tell us now that's been printed to the console that means that when i called sc.next for the first time it returned a so this was replaced with an a when i called sc.next for the second time it returned me a b because the b was after the first set of o o o so I can replace that with a B. And finally, when I called sc.next for the last time, it returned me a C, because obviously C was the last thing that was sandwiched in between the OOO, so if I re replace it with a C. So now you guys will see return types in action. I replaced A, B, and C, sorry, I replaced the next with their respective return values, exactly as if they were strings in the first place. And if I run that, we will get the exact same output. There we go. So that's uh, a little bit more like, I guess, examples on how return types work and how you can treat them. Okay, awesome. So now let me go into the whole thing with um, delimiters. So if I was to actually, it control Z until I get these next back in. So say I didn't have spaces in between the characters and the string I wanted to analyze had two colons in between each character. Then what I would do is I would change the delimiter of SC so I do sc dot use delimiter and then inside where it says pattern right there, I'd replace that with two columns. And of course I would add on two columns at the end here. And now you'll see what happens. Exact same output, which is what we want. Now essentially it's treating these two columns as a white space as if, cause that is the delimiter. And now we can actually say you have a ton of these. So you have A, B, C, D, E, or whatever, and then like you, for some reason, have to sift through them and get anything that's not two colons. You can use this program. You can quite literally just make a system out of the print line that chains these together and prints out something with the delimiter of the two colons. And just to show you guys, um, I will print out SC dot next line. So you can see what that does. Yeah, see that next line quite literally just takes the entire string and prints it out. All right, so we figured out how to scan strings, but the whole point of this was to get user input, right? So how do we get that? Now this is actually now that you guys know how string scanning works, not that not that hard at all. You will replace whatever's inside these quotes with the words system dot in like we did earlier, and now essentially what is going to happen is whenever I run this method. Oh, sorry, that's the main method. It'll wait. If I say sc dot uh, next line, it will wait for the user to type something in. So now, all right, um, I want to type in my name. It prints it out back to me. Now, why is that? It's because once I clicked enter, that del that denoted a line, and obviously the code takes sc dot next line and immediately just prints it out. So now let's say I want to do like a similar thing, but I want to do like a, like an echo, right? So what I'm going to do is take sc.nextline out, create a string, call it s, set it equal to sc.nextline, and then print out s plus, oh, I'll type print out, your name is, and then s. So now when I run this, I can type in Varun 
and it'll say, your name is Varun. So now you can immediately see how we can make this interactive. If I put a print before I actually check for the next line, I can say something along the line is, what is your name? And now what will essentially happen is that the program will ask me, what is my name? And then I'll type in Varun, I'll click enter, and it'll say, your name is Varun. So this scanner essentially allows us to quickly prototype interactive programs just in general. And now you can see how you can pass an input into a scanner and say, for example, you wanted to type in something along the lines of the A colon colon B colon colon C. What you could say is um, a practice program you can make is have the user give you something that has three tokens delineated by um, some delimiter that you create. And then what it'll do is it'll take those and print out the tokens back to you without the limiters. So you can, you can create that really quickly if you'd like. So now um, we will go into the more specific methods here. And there are issues with these specific reads and I will explain them right now. So because has next int, has next double and has next boolean, uh, sorry, not, not the has version, sorry. Just next int, next double and next boolean because they all have return types of integer, double, and Boolean, they're a lot more restricted as to what exactly they can be. A string can be anything. It can be a string representation of the number one. It can be a string representation of a decimal. It can be a string representation of like the word true. Strings can hold just about anything, but integers are stuck between values of negative two something, negative two billion something to positive two billion something doubles are obviously stuck as the decimal values and booleans are even more stuck. They can only hold the values of true and false. So how do we make sure that when I type in something into, into the console and press enter that the computer doesn't say, okay, I want to read in an integer, but this gave me the letter S I just can't do that. What it'll do is if, if you try to give it um, a string, when it's trying to read in an integer using next int, it'll just crash. So let me do that. So I will change this to be copy paste this back, back in. What is your age? And then I'll do int s or I'll do int a equals sc dot next int. And now what I'll do here is I'll just say your age is, and I'll replace that with A. So now you'll see, it'll ask me for my age. If I actually input a number, it'll give me a bag because it read it as an integer and then it'll print out that integer insisting on the print line. But say I run this again and say someone in their haste of typing and they typed in like 17 and then the letter U by accident. What'll happen if I click enter it'll give me this error. And when someone's using the program, they don't want to see a bunch of text in their face with jargon. And like, when you get this error message, it'll be daunting and you won't really know what to do. But if we break it down, you can see what it says here. Exception and thread main, which says essentially means there is an issue in the main thread, which is, this is the main thread, java.util.input mismatch exception. And that's basically it. It expected one input, but you gave it another. So there are ways around that. The, the, the more I'd say concrete way is to use those has methods. So for example, if I put if sc dot has next int, then I will call this. What this does is says, okay, so let me check for a next int. And if this returns true, because remember with return types, if there is an extent, this will be replaced with the word true. If there's not an extent, it'll be replaced with the word false, with the word false. So if SC is actually an int, then what will happen is um, it will actually execute the code within the if check. And you can immediately see an issue here with, remember I talked about scopes earlier. I defined the integer A within the scope of the if statement. And this print line is actually outside of the if statement. So I have to actually delete this mm -hmm. and then do 
int a equals zero because we want default default value to be zero, right? So now what we'll do is I will run this and then I'll say, what is your age? And I'll do a normal test first and then I'll say, okay, your age is one. Let's run that again and say, I type in like some string, right? Instead of crashing this time, it'll say my age is zero. Now, why is that? Because when I checked for sc.hasnext int, it said, okay, that is false. That was not an integer what I typed in. So I'll skip over this code and just print this out. And obviously the default value is zero. So now we can actually make this a bit more interactive by putting an else statement. And what this does is we put this inside here and it says, okay, if the person that is using this program actually gives me an integer, I will save that and, and then actually print out the age. Otherwise, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say invalid input. Mm -hmm. And then if I click run and say I type in something crazy right like that, it'll say invalid input, which is a lot easier on the eyes than that fat chunk of code from earlier. So that is one way to check um, whether the input is, is accurate. Uh, another way to do it is through something called a try catch statement, which I will show you guys right now. Try catches are a lot more robust in that they can handle much more than just errors thrown from scanners. These things can handle just about anything and they're almost like safeguards for your code. And it's quite literally in the name of a try catch. Try executing this block of code. If you fail, then catch it, like catch the error and do something else. So what I'm gonna write here is this, I'm gonna do try and then I'm going to do um, a equals sc dot next in. Mm -hmm. And then sys out your, your age and then plus a. Now what I'll do here is this. I will type in a catch block, which is the second. Think of this almost like an if else statement and it's try catch. That's the second part of it. But the thing about catch is that you actually need to tell what am I catching? Like specifically, what am I going to be catching? And there are so many errors that could happen, but until you get into like the nuances and you're fine tuning your code to catch certain types of errors, you can just catch every single error by typing in exception E. Now, is this good practice in coding? Probably not. Because the issue with calling an exception E is when you want to get into like higher level programming, you want to know what went wrong in your code, not just that it went wrong. If you do your catch as an exception, it'll only tell you the fact that the code went wrong. Something went wrong, not exactly what. Now, if I change this to input mismatch exception E, I believe, yeah. And you're gonna have to import some exceptions because they're not necessarily existing within the code. And um, sorry, no, they don't exist within just the default, I'd say what is given to you in a blank class. So you have to import some stuff and you can read the imports at the top here. I imported scanner and I imported mismatch exception. It should auto do this for you by the way, but in case you're having some random red lines with scanner while you're trying it out, try pasting this code in. All right. Let's continue. So if I have an input mismatch exception, what I can do is specifically, I know that it caught the input mismatch exception. So I can do sys out wrong input dummy. Okay. So now let's think about exactly what we want to do here. So if we have an integer coming in to our code, we will try to read it. And obviously since it's an integer, it will succeed and it will do the try statement. Now a catch statement is the other case. Is it not an integer? Then what we will do is print out wrong input dummy. And there is another part you can add to try catch statements called a finally that will execute no matter what. So you can do sys out, thank you. So how this works is this system.in gets the input. All right. Save tries to save it to an integer. If it fails, it says wrong input, but we'll always print out. Thank you. No matter what. And a quick thing about the error handling as well, like what you put into the catch block, 
Um, what was I going to say? I think something along the lines of you can also specifically print out do e dot print stack trace. And what this will do is I remember the first time I ran this and actually got the error that is called the stack trace. And if you want for debugging purposes to actually try and like read that, say once you guys get more into programming, you'll actually be able to read those errors and understand what they mean and what they're telling you. So at a certain point, you'll actually want to know what the stack trace is. So at that point you'll do e dot print stack trace. So if I run this, it'll ask me for my age. We already know that positive works. So we're going to try negative. E -e -e -e. That is not an age, but I press enter. It'll say wrong input dummy print the stack trace, which we saw before, but it will always print thank you, which is the purpose of that finally block. So those were two ways to just handle errors in general. Like I said, this one's a bit more robust, but also you have to know how to use it properly. And it is a little bit more com uh, complex syntactically because it's using a different, I guess, block of code. You're used to ifs at this point, but I would definitely try practicing using these mainly because once we get into robot code, these can be pretty useful. Oh, uh, that's what, this is what I was gonna say about the catch thing. Um, the reason that you want to be careful of what you put into here is whatever is in the try statement as you get into higher level like programming things it could throw multiple exceptions so you're going to have to chain them together so the way you do that is i believe you put this and then you do oh i have to give a different exception let's do What's what's a what's a different exception that I've um, run into? Um, null pointer exception. So basically, what this says is oh, I don't need that. This catch statement will now catch either an input mismatch exception or a null pointer exception. So if you have multiple things um, thrown within that try block, like multiple errors, you can chain these together to get specifics. And of course, like I said, if you are struggling with that, you don't necessarily know what um, error is thrown, then you can just type in exception E. But like I said, be warned that you won't get specific data if you print out the stack trace. All right, so that is everything with try catches. So I can just, um, I can actually, actually I'll keep this code because I will talk about the final part of today, which is really quite simple. And honestly, you guys might've experimented this by yourself, but it is mathematical methods. So as of right now, we've only been doing things with strings and we've used like the plus operator within strings, but we can also do that to integers as well. Cause obviously they're numbers, right? We can add them together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for their age again. And I'm going to delete the stack trace cause I don't want to do it with that. And I'm going to say your age in five years, because we're going to give them the current age and then your age in five years plus a, and in parentheses, I'll do a plus five quite simple. You literally just say a, the integer plus five. What is my age? I am five years old. Therefore my age in five years is 10. Easy enough, right? And now let's say I want to actually, let's do doubles. I'm going to just change this to be double equals sc.next double and I can do my age in 5.5 years and I can do plus 5.5. My age is 17. So in 5.5 years, I'll be 22 and a half years old. So that's how you can add. You can also subtract. So your age, oops, your age, uh, 5.5 years ago, if I was to subtract 5.5 from them. What is your age? I am five years old. So five and a half years ago, I was in my, in my mom. That's where I was. And then so now what we can do is change this to be, let's say, let's say, why don't we do something along the lines of, oh yeah. So this is the part that does get some people. With integers, if you guys remember, they can only hold whole number values. So what happens if I was to divide, let's say three divided by two, 
So why don't we try that out? I'm going to just uh, cut all this code for now and then do a sys, sys out and then three divided by two. You'd think the answer would be 1.5, but it returns one. Now, why is that? Because how integers work is that they floor themselves. If you were to do something with integer division and you divided something that would return a fraction to you, the, what, what it will do is it'll take that fraction that should theoretically be returned and just floor it down to the closest integer, not the closest, the lowest closest integer. So for example, three divided by two is 1.5 but then that gets converted into one because if you cut out the 0.5 from the one, it just truncates the decimal, if that makes more sense to you guys. So how do we get around this? Well, first things first, you can just do double B equals one, if equals like three, and then dub, double C equals two. And then I can print out B divided by C. And now it'll actually print out the value of 1.5 because doubles can actually hold those values. And so the thing, the issue with typing out whole numbers um, within your code is that it'll automatically be considered an integer. So if you want to uh, have these be doubles, what you can do is 3.0 divided by 2.0. And now because you added the decimal, when you actually, oh, I messed up there. When you added the, because you added the decimal um, when you created this, it'll treat them as doubles and you'll get the same result we got as if we had created double variables. So there are a lot of things that you guys can um, do with this knowledge to see what else is there. There is addition, subtraction, I showed you division, we can do multiplication. Seven point five. And finally, uh, the weirdest one that is the one probably that you guys have not seen before. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't is something called modulus. So modulus essentially says, um, div divide the first number by the second number and don't give me what that result is, but give me the remainder. So for example, um, 50 modulus seven, 50 divided by seven, give me the remainder. So obviously seven times seven is 49. So the remainder of 50 divided by seven is going to give me one. And if we print this out, it'll give us one. And let's say I increase this to like 55. Five mod seven should return six because 55 divided by seven and the remainder is six. So that is modulus. And these can be applied to any number primitive. You will get some funky stuff if you use decimals, but I'm sure you guys can figure this out by yourself. Uh, some some cool tricks with this that you can do is, I believe if you have say one, a number like 125 and then you mod it by 10, the result will give you the ones place. Mod it by 100, you'll get everything, you'll get the tens and the ones place. So then you can you can just you can work through this like uh, say you want to separate an integer into its place values. You can easily do that with modulus and division and some multiplication. So that is going to be basically all for this video today. I think uh, we covered a basic object instantiation, scanner as well as system.in, um, some scanner stuff to do with strings, some scanner stuff to do with the console, error handling using if checks and try cast statements, and then the basic math methods. So, um, and I will actually type those out in here for you guys so you can reference this because I'm gonna be uploading this to the GitHub. Math uh, operators. I've been calling them methods, but it's technically called operators. You got plus, minus, this is how you multiply, this is how you divide, and then finally you have percent, which is mod, oh, no. You have percent, which is modulus. So those are the math operators. And then um, I think I mentioned earlier that there is a math class um, that you guys can import and use in your project that has tons of useful stuff like trigonometric functions, um, absolute value, I think some more other complicated stuff like square root and power. That will be outlined in the problems I'm gonna give you guys. And there's just basically gonna be some pro really simple problems. I think 
I'm gonna make maybe one or two of those. And then I'm going to assign you guys a project, which is going to be create a calculator. Now it's pretty daunting, but it's gonna be a very, very, very simple calculator. It's going to use a combination of scanner, error handling, and these math methods. And that is all for today, guys. All right, I will see you guys next time.